the program for tonight um, is quite simple. There's dinner, and then uh, there is a, a program. So I will start by inviting uh, Professor Roger Bonacase, who is the Dean of the Cockrell School of Engineering, for some opening remarks. All right, well, good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to see all these uh, faces here for a nice in-person event to celebrate uh, Tom Edgar and everything he's done for the University of Texas and the Cockrell School of Engineering and, of course, the McKetta Department of of uh, chemical engineering. Um, so Tom was actually the department chair who, who hired me. Uh, so I, uh, I still remember that day that I came uh, for my interview. Uh, so Chad with Tom, maybe with somebody else, he took me to the infamous CPE 2.222 that many of you know for my seminar. And so I'm giving my talk and uh, you know, I'm scanning the audience to kind of get a gauge of how people are feeling. I look in the back, and Tom Edgar's fast asleep. <laughs> <coughs> I'm thinking, oh, I'm doomed. I'm, now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doomed. <laughs> um, but amazingly, when the end of my talk came, and, and Tom was awakened by the applause, uh, he he actually asked a really incisive question. Um, and I actually saw Tom do this on many occasions uh, <laughs> in seminars, in faculty meetings when he wasn't department chair, and I realized that he really has this meditative state where it appears <laughs> that he's sleeping, but he's actually absorbing all the material and then coming up with exactly the right question. Um, so somewhere along the lines, Tom mentioned to me, he goes, hey, you know, there's a bunch of faculty to get together and play pickup basketball at lunch. And I said, okay, you know, I played a lot of pickup basketball at Caltech. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, I go, you know what, I, I bet I can do it. So, uh, you know, I, so I went to a game and uh, I was terrified. <laughs> um, I mean, these guys, including Tom, were like crashing into each other and everything else. And so uh, after, after that hour, I said, OK, I'm just going to go play squash, because there I'll be armed with a racket, and it'll be a lot, a lot safer uh, going forward. Um, but I, I would like to say that it's really been an absolute pleasure uh, you know, working and, and interacting with Tom. I mean, I can say without exaggeration, I wouldn't be here without Tom. Um, and it's not just that I was hired when he was chair. Uh, he gave me so much good advice along the way about all sorts of things, whether it was in my research, uh, when I became department chair, helping me when I was thinking how managing you know, the, the nascent center, uh, and all sorts of uh, other activities. Um, and so it's really a joy uh, uh, to be here to honor him for everything he's done. So thank you so much, Tom. Uh, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So. I invite you to enjoy your dinner and the conversation at the table, and then later on, uh, Michael Baldea will come up and start the festivities where the real roasting will begin. Yeah. Uh, Today, and so far, we have heard a lot of memories a lot of stories from Tom's students and collaborators and friends. So now, it's the time to get the true story. <laughs> also known as the roast. So Tom has led technology development um, for so long. And so a roast is, um, it's just too pedestrian. So, so what we're gonna do is, is, is Rose Tom um, high tech. So we're, we're gonna use the latest sous vide cooking innovation. So sous vide are, are the French words for under vacuum. For those of you who, who are not in, in the know and up to date with the latest in the in kitchen gadgets. 
this is the latest thing, right? So it involves taking a piece of meat and wrapping it in a plastic bag, vacuuming the bag, boiling the bag, removing the meat from the bag, throwing it on the grill, and that's the finishing touch. So supposedly it's really tender and delicious. So this is what will happen with Tom. Uh, So we'll do a, a, a multi-step batch process where I will do the vacuum packing and cooking, boiling at low temperature. And then we have our master roaster, Wayne Beckett, uh, who will do the, yeah, uh, we, go ahead. So. <laughs> I would tend to save the applause until after the performer has delivered, but <laughs> Wayne is such a hyped performer that we can applaud in advance. So I, he, he will do the, the grilling. So, so now to the, the vacuum pack. Um, lowering pressure lowers the boiling point, and that's the idea behind sous vide. So it cools things off. And in our professional community, it's, it's well known that Tom has, has always kept his cool. And he had a balancing effect on, on meetings, nasty conference discussions, and so on. So the man is unflappable. I, I've never seen him angry. Which doesn't mean he doesn't get angry, but at least I haven't. Um, his sense of humor is, is famous, and it's, it's one of the, actually, pillars of the awards that he gave out at our summit conferences. And, and those awards are, are kind of like COVID. It's, it's something that you really don't want to get. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always served him well in his administrative work. So earlier today, I mentioned that he was the captain of three ships. So Christopher Columbus had Nina, Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Tom captained, as I mentioned earlier, leadership, scholarship. What was the third one, Tom? That's right. <laughs> wow. He did it well with the true north in mind. Thank you. So this is, this is already collaborative, right? Just like the rest of the work that Tom was doing. So actually, before I learned about leadership, scholarship, and Santa Maria, I had known about Tom as an undergrad. So I um, did my undergrad studies in Romania, and I came across his textbook. And I thought, man, this is an excellent book. The cover was just so shiny. <laughs> the quality of the print was amazing compared to the textbooks that we had that were printed in the Soviet era on something that looked like upgraded bathroom tissue. <laughs> it was just unbelievable. This book was beautiful. And then I got to the content of it, and of course, that kind of that kind of steered me towards doing undergrad research in process control and later becoming a researcher in, in process control. But that book, something else. And there, there's some other things. So I mentioned Tom had a good sense of humor. There's, there's other things that I learned um, from Tom as far as humor goes. One of the first emails that I got from him um, arrived when I was waiting at the AT&T Center uh, for him to pick me up for my interview dinner. So Jim mentioned his brief emails. And this email had no introduction, no signature. It just said, no ties, no coats for dinner. Weather will be nice all week. So then I discovered that he was not much of a coat and tie guy himself. 
I'm, I'm actually amazed that you're wearing this suit. Um, in fact, I remember a certain off-white polo shirt with little dots that as you got closer, turned out to be little Tabasco bottles. <laughs> and he wore that for our consortium meetings. There's also the turquoise puffer jacket with the old Apple logo that came out during the cold season. Given to me by Steve Jobs, believe it or not. Oh, vintage. <laughs> <laughs> so ultimately, what, what I learned is Tom wasn't taking himself too seriously, but, but he took his work very seriously. And I, I think that was one of the secrets of his tremendous professional success. The other thing that I learned from Tom was, was his ability to manage time. So he was, everybody knows, as it was mentioned repeatedly here, that he was incredibly engaged at group meetings and department seminars. That's while he was awake. For the rest of my life, I will be jealous when I remember how seamlessly he was able to fall asleep, stay asleep, wake up, do so very quietly. There was absolutely no noise associated with this. And then just ask a very sharp question. So this. This must be, like Dean Bonnake said, a meditative state that, that he has reached ahead of all mankind. <laughs> so, so he certainly made effective use of his meetings. That's for sure. I should also say that entering his office was, was an experience. Um, his desk was, was sort of a barricade of, of papers, and it had stacks that, that really could reach a few feet in, in height, and, and Stephanie said they were gravity-defying. Um, so, so but, but what was amazing is that he could go and then just with surgical precision pull out a paper. So he'd, he'd been, it, that, that paper had been filed away with the Edgar system years ago. He could just go and extract the one paper. So. I really think that this is not the result of Tom being inherently messy, because he, he really isn't, as far as I can tell. It's just more a reflection of the fact that he didn't need to waste time filing papers away in the traditional way. So it's just being efficient. Another example of Tom spending his time well. So there's this cake picture that's shown in, in some of these slides is the 20th anniversary of the Texas, Wisconsin, California Control Consortium that happened at USC, University of Southern California in Los Angeles. And so the meeting was supposed to end sometime around noon, and we had a flight to catch coming back. Tom had the, the rental car. And I was sort of getting antsy, at which point Tom said, Joe has really good food. That was Joe Chen. And so we had to wait until the catered lunch was brought in. And since he had the rental car, I was just sort of stuck there with him. But you know, lunch was really good, and yes, we made our flight, so he does make good use of his time, but he has his priorities. So speaking of lunch, right, later that year, I think, we met over lunch again, and this was in Tom's office. So I watched with some interest, I'd say, um, as he pulls out of the fridge underneath his desk, um, what I thought was a sandwich that had been served at a meeting earlier that day. And, and then I thought to myself, man, <laughs> this guy is frugal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and as a young assistant professor who just quit a very lucrative industry job, <laughs> So we re reanalyzed my career choices. So Tom was at that point an established chair professor, famous author, so on and so forth. And I was like, hmm, um, is this what the future looks like? <laughs> so 
So, so then I said, I'm, I'm going to make the commitment to be more frugal myself. Maybe that's the example to follow. So then that lasted um, until I got yelled at again by Tom, who told me, <laughs> don't nickel, your di nickel and dime yourself when he came to attending a conference or, or something like that. So then I understood that Tom has, has in fact, mastered the art of being efficient, but not just with his time, also with his resources. And, and so... Um, in fact, over the years, I discovered that he was, he was very generous and, and a sensitive soul. So to that point, as I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for Wayne to come up here, I want to mention um, the way he closed his acceptance speech for the Richard Bellman Memorial Award, which is really the highest honor in control. And so he closed with, and I had a crummy career, and his voice was breaking at that point. So Crummy is, of course, taken out of context here and exactly the, the opposite of what his career has been. Um, so I'm really grateful that I was able to share that past, past decade or so with him to some point. And Tom, thank you so much. And I'm hoping that my voice is not breaking when I say that I and, and all of us will, will miss you dearly. So this was, this was the under vacuum low temperature part. We're, we're going to the high temperature section. All right, Michael, thanks a lot. I, I'm kind of blown away because my remembrance of Tom and the stacks of papers in his office, I was assuming within the last 10 years, everything would be more electronic. So I'm shocked that he's still able to go to these stacks and pick out uh, the proper table. Now, okay, so I'm gonna, I've got like kind of three sections to this uh, talk, if you will. Uh, one is related to Tom and the cash awards chair position that he's held for um, three or more decades. Tom's impact on political culture, and then Tom's impact on popular culture. I just realized I need to make use. Oh, I actually have a coin here. So watch your eyes. Okay. All right. So Robin Craven. So, so those of you that were at the talk this afternoon have seen this, but one comment she made, this is related to the CPC Awards component. So my fondest memories of Tom was a passion, fun, he and Wayne, I should say actually Dale Seaboard for the most part, they let me get involved a little bit later, would bring to the CPC awards at the end of the CPC banquets, they would MC a short awards program for current and past CPC alums. I found myself laughing hysterically and I'm not even a chemical engineer, it was refreshing to see Tom and his colleagues having such a good time poking fun at each other. And that was kind of life with Tom, right, at every conference, so, so we always Look forward to that. I guess there's actually more to that story because my first CPC was in 1991 and I actually didn't know what to expect. And so I kind of see what's going on. Tom is kind of at the back of the room watching the speakers and, you know, some whatever statement. Tom's, you know, writing something down to make comments. And then people are starting to come with him with like slips of paper. And so what he's doing is he's accumulating some things for these special awards that he would give at the end of the conference. So you became almost like a, a writer for the Letterman Show or something. It's like If you were a young assistant professor and you could get a dig in that Tom would bring at the last you know, CP Awards, then, then you would really accomplish something in life. Um, okay, so <laughs> as an example, Tom, and this is Jim Rawlings mentioned this earlier, so he actually himself won an award, okay, so over 30 years ago, for spending one year at a Conoco plant 20 years ago, which we found out then may have only actually been like a six-week experience. So, uh, so anyway, he won this award at CPC 1991. All right, so, so we've, I think everybody knows what's coming next. We had this term that's been used throughout the, I guess it's illegal in Florida, it may be illegal in Texas for all I know. But anyway, is Tom woke? And I think we all know the answer to that. So he's, he's not even woke on a panel. He was probably actually the chair of that panel discussion, for all I know. But it was, uh, 
It was time to do his multitasking, and he <laughs> took over it well. Okay, so, so the next section, so influencing the influencers is kind of the subtitle. Um, and, and we've actually seen this in the revolving slideshow. So we have this presentation, um, Will Computers Control the World? Okay, pretty much an all-compassing type of title, February 22nd, 1989. Now, what I love about this, you know, when you look at, at the aspects of his talk, you know, he's, he's showing global climate change is occurring. Uh, he's showing how the, the average temperature has been coming up over time. He's showing CO2 levels coming up. And so he's, he's giving this great lecture, right? Looking out over the lecture hall, but little did we know who was in the audience but Al Gore <laughs> listening intensely to this. And so Al Gore apparently came up, um, you know, with, with his concern about glyph just solely due to Tom's presentation. <laughs> so in kind of the spirit of the way Tom would do the CPC awards, what I'm saying is Tom should get the I Invented the Internet Award. Okay, that goes to Tom Edgar for convincing Al Gore of the importance of global climate change after spending the DOE's hard-earned work money working on underground coal gasification for 10 years. So only Tom Edgar could manage to pull that off. Okay, so we know that our allies are very important. So Tom was running this uh, energy center. What was it, em embattled? I can't remember exactly what the, the term, embattled energy center. Okay, and so we've seen a lot of different U.S. presidents, you know, make their way over to Saudi Arabia. So I'm not making any comments about Democratic presidents versus Republican presidents. Uh, but what's interesting about all this, what's little known, is who set the stage for all these interactions. And it turns out to be Tom and Dale Seaborg. Uh, actually, it was a visit to Kuwait, but even. OK. So this is really, a lot of people in this audience are not going to know this one. So he's really had a big influence on the mainstream media. Now, some of you are probably too young to remember <laughs> Burt Reynolds and uh, the cosmopolitan man pose, but there's a lot more to this story. Burt Reynolds actually got his idea from the following photo <laughs> of Tom Edgar. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, so I, the next couple of slides are from Jeff Sirola. And so, so Jeff had met, uh, met Tom on a conference that they were going to, uh, to China 30 some odd years ago. And so they had organized like this big dinner out in China. So they were dining out. And if you've been to China, you know how you have these big round tables and the food is kind of passed around a circle and everything. And so they were seated around this round table. After the first course, the waitress is kind of looking around the table, walking around. And what she did is she stopped behind Tom and presented him with a fork because it was probably perhaps the only fork that they had in the restaurant. It was clear that Tom was the one person in need of that fork. <laughs> okay, so this is also from Jeff Sirola. So he's talking about Tom's beard. We've heard a little bit about that today. So still that beard seemed to raise concerns. Every time he crossed a border, all his stuff was reinspected. <laughs> we had the same flight back to the States. And the last thing we saw as we were clearing customs in San Francisco was Tom taking his suitcases. So maybe this is why you don't uh, have a beard anymore. Okay, so we're getting close to the end here. So we've actually seen some of these slides throughout this slideshow uh, tonight. So this was the UT faculty in the early 1970s, I guess 1973. You know, this kind of very diverse group of, of white, you know, a small group <laughs> of white men. All right. And so what I want to present based on the next slide is the Governor Greg Abbott Wokeness Award because that was the early 70s. Okay. So by 1988, I want to show you this huge group of very diverse white men. Um, you know, there's, there's actually a few people not. Oh, actually, there's a Canadian. So I think that counted in diversity. George Georgiou, I'm not sure where he is, he said that when he was hired, he was considered a diversity uh, candidate. So, 
So things have, have changed quite a bit uh, since then. And what, um, so I, I guess maybe I would summarize on, on a high note. It's been an incredible, <laughs> sorry, I get to, at this, at this age, it, it's been an incredible 40 years. I, I, I've really enjoyed all of our different experiences together. I'm really glad I cho chose you as a graduate student. It's been a, a fantastic time. And so what we're looking forward to is the, uh, the rebuttal that you're coming up with in, in a few minutes here. But thanks a lot. <laughs> so, Tom, as you work on the rebuttal, we figured we gave you enough material. But in case you run out of material and you try to solve things in a different way, we have a little gift for you. Would you? <laughs> well, he's not here, so. <laughs> this is from all of us for your retirement pursuits. Would you please open it? And, well, no, the putter itself. I think that's, tell, us, tell us what it says. <laughs> Tom the Bomb Edgar. All right, so we'll give Tom a little bit of time to prepare his rebuttal. I think there's still coffee coming. Of course there is. So as Tom prepares his rebuttal, we are taking... Yes, so I, I was going to bring the microphone around, but if you'd like, please come to the front. I should also say that um, there is a, a book that I'd like to invite you to, to sign at the, the front desk over there, in, in case you haven't had a chance to do so. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm Noel Bell. I was a student of Tom's in the 80s and uh, showed up, and he had a project, water gas shift reactor, taking syngas from underground coal gasification, and I said, okay, that sounds great. He said, well, there's this new catalyst that's not susceptible to sulfur poisoning. And it might give you your first clue as to where this is going. So, uh, we, uh, you know, one of the great things I thought about Tom's programs was kind of the giant programs we had. And one riot, one ranger, we would build pretty extensive laboratory equipment and pilot plants. I built a you know, a water gas shift reactor chemical plant. And uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun and a lot of work. And we all worked together, had great support from Dr. Edgar, had good equipment. So I was using hydrogen sulfide, had a H2S monitor in the lab for safety, and, you know, was running this reactor system. Well, as you might guess, uh, once in a while somebody would say, we smell H2S. And I think most often they would first go to Dr. Edgar and they'd say, your lab has got H2S leaking somewhere. You better get it fixed. And of course, you know, people smell rotten eggs and they get a little nervous, right? And so uh, Dr. Edgar would calmly tell me to see if, you know, figure out what's going on, fix it. So I would check my scrubber and say, well, and I'd walk up on the, the roof of the new building and I couldn't find it, and then it would go away, and people wouldn't complain. And, uh, but then a few weeks later, same thing would happen again. Finally, I think the safety committee got involved. <laughs> and I think Dr. Brock said, well, you don't have any packing in your scrubber. So as a good you know, laboratory institution, research institution, somebody had a bucket of Rasha rings, so I found some Rasha rings and put them in the scrubber and tried to make it work. So. Again, a few weeks later, sulfur smell again. I said, gosh, I don't know what's going on. And, it, and the, alarm, the uh, alarm in the lab wasn't going off. Well, this was the new building, and the exhaust system was really good in that building. And I guess one time I was walking in one of the utility corridors, and I smelled 
H2S or rotten eggs. And um, I said, where is that coming from? And so the problem wasn't our equipment. It was that the water traps were drying out and the sewer gas was coming up through the water traps. <laughs> so, so it wasn't us at all. It was the sewer traps. So from that point on, I'd go around, I don't know, went once every couple of weeks and pour a bucket of water down in all the drains. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, the point was more about how those great projects I thought were really useful. And we did simulation, dynamic simulation, process control, and, and reactor design. And honestly, in my career, I've done all of those things. And in fact, I'm still doing them. So I really appreciate uh, that I was able to work on that kind of project. And I know a lot of other people in here had s similar large projects. And I really appreciate that that uh, Dr. Edgar would support that and get funding for that kind of work. So that's great memories for me. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. So next we have Professor Allen. So this is another big thank you to Tom. Tom uh, recruited me to UT. I'd been a chair at uh, UCLA and uh, being a good department chair, I went and looked around at all the leading departments that we aspired to compete with and uh, didn't believe the US News and World Report rankings. And so what I did was do my own ranking. How many undergraduates do they graduate? How many faculty do they have? How many PhDs do they graduate? How many research dollars do they bring in? How many papers do they publish? And I got all those statistics and all the top chemi departments were here, and UT was up here. Okay? And I said, who is doing that? And Tom was chair of the chemical engineering department. And uh, I asked Tom, would you be on my visiting committee? And he agreed, and I wanted to find out what the secret sauce was. What made UT so great? And uh, he recruited me to UT away from UCLA, but I found out what the secret sauce was, which was collegiality. Liking and enjoying the company of your colleagues. And that was the environment that Tom created. Thank you, Tom. And thank you for 25 great years at UT. I'm Nicholas Peppers, and I am one of the colleagues of uh, Tom Edgar for 20 years. I met Tom, I'm a little bit younger than Tom, and I met him uh, at the end of my graduate studies. He doesn't remember it, at an ASCHC meeting. And then in 1976, at the, I think it was the Parker House, or whatever it was called in Chicago, that Hilton and we were at the Exxon Suite. The Exxon Suite was a place where all the diverse groups of chemical engineering at that time, basically all male drunk, were getting together at night, staying until one o'clock in the morning. And there was Tom and myself and Clark Colton and Gary Leal from, he would never miss that place, and always the maestro. The maestro, of course, was Jim Carberry, who would say old stories from England and the United States and so on. Things were difficult. Money was not exist in existence. NSF was giving very little. And in the spring or summer of 1978, when Tom was an associate professor and I was, I had just become an assistant professor, associate professor at Purdue, the Pittsburgh Energy Technology Center announced these grants for coal. And I know you cannot imagine a biomedical engineer like me and a control man like Tom getting together at about the same time, writing grants, getting the proposals funded, and starting working on coal. I was working on coal liquefaction, he was working on coal gasification. And it was a great time, and that's what some of the students mentioned earlier today. Uh, all of you talked about the control work, and you avoided talking about the coal work. And we used to... Uh, go to Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh uh, every fall, I think. Uh, terrible times, but nice times. <laughs> and we would give our presentation. I remember that uh, Bobby Wellick, for those of you who remember Wellick, 
was a supervisor at Pittsburgh Energy Technology Center. That's how I met him before he went at NSF. And then things continued, and of course, in 2002, in the summer, I decided to accept an offer, and I came here in the fall. Uh, Roger, our dean now, made the point that you're not wearing ties. Of course, I did wear ties. <laughs> And uh, immediately I approached Tom because I wanted to continue the work with Frank Doyle. But Frank was at Delaware, I was at UT. How could we continue? We started talking, the result was some exceptional work in the field that was not mentioned by anybody today. It was on control and biocontrol, and it was with PhD student Terry Farmer, who sends you his regards and with a PhD student, Irma Yolanda Sanchez, who got her PhD from Monterrey, and she's doing very well at the University of Te the Tecnológico de Monterrey. So it is so unusual, but so characteristic of the university. Two individuals who were simply chemical engineers, but who had really no other common interests, found themselves on two different occasions, on two different subjects, and they worked together. And this is what convergence is. This is what bringing all the areas together is, and this is what really makes this place a great place, a place where all pre present disciplines and past disciplines, they all get together to solve very problem problems for society and for humanity. Thank you, Tom. Hello there. Um, uh, I'm from the same school Wayne is in the terms of our tenure here at UT, so I'm going to kind of step up here and um, introduce myself. I'm Dave Dalamali. I'm a student of Tom Edgar's from uh, the 80s. I got here a year after Wayne did. We shared a lot of the same memories. Um, and I think Stephanie showed the tree of influence Tom had in the different disciplines. I was Tom's first student in AI, and you might have noticed that branch wasn't really on the tree back <laughs> Back in the 80s, um, and, and Jim Davis mentioned it, how there was a, a strong interest and then a quick fading of AI back then. Um, but uh, uh, so I was, uh, worked for Tom in the 80s. I was also an alumni of Tom's in terms of the uh, taking care of the uh, Edgar children. Uh, where's Jeff at today? Yeah, there he is. Uh, Jeff, uh, I think Becky was staying somewhere else that time, but Jeff had a couple friends over and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry, Tom. Uh, what, what happened in the house stays in the house, though. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, so uh, another time when you retire, there's a good roast coming for what you and your friends were up to. But um, I had prepared a lot of notes, you know, and, and to talk about Tom, and I noticed during the seminar today, it was kind of like corporate buzzword bingo. I was well, checking that off. Somebody covered the napping uh, there, and... Um, the, the stacks of paper being uh, handed out at various times. Um, but uh, it, there was another point that Jim Davis mentioned earlier about his brief communications, very sharp and to the point. And uh, this story is from a colleague who couldn't be here tonight, Dave Osgen, who came here to talk about coming to graduate school. And he came into Tom's office and he said, um, Tom, I've, I, I know I signed up to come to get a master's degree here, but I'm going to go to law school. And Tom said, you know, what was, the, Jim, was it like five words or less? He said, well, Dave, shit or get off the pot. You know, either you're going to do this thing or you're not going to do this thing. And it was very, very direct communication, right to the point. Uh, Dave had a, later, I, later Tom would soften that down and, and use it in our seminars as, come on, fish or cut bait, more <laughs> tolerable. Um, so, uh, you know, I heard another, um, a number of stories about Tom, and in fact, uh, Wayne was the first kind of to bring up, it was on the slide here, of his Joel King Award. Uh, it was kind of in passing, it wasn't mentioned during the day today. Well, I actually dug out and found my brochure from the ceremony, and, and Tom, before we leave tonight, I want you to have, I want you to autograph that for me. <laughs> but like Wayne said, it was very forward-looking of Tom to think about computers and what they were going to do, and the mention of global warming back then. And so I was also thinking of the Al Gore. Uh, you know, Tom was doing Al Gore before Al Gore was Al Roker, you know, predicting the weather and the environment. And so he was really ahead of his time in 1989 
when he got that award, and he made this really forward-looking talk about computers and their influence, and you know, climate change back then in '89. It really wasn't, uh, you know, in the news on a regular basis back then. So that was really um, good of Tom to think of that ahead of time, ahead of his time. Um, you know, Tom. One of the reasons I liked to, and I wanted to work for Tom, is that sense of humor. And we've heard about that all day today. And uh, we heard of his infamous, you know, going to seminars and pre presenting awards. And so there were times when myself and other grad students uh, would kind of act as the Letterman team for Tom and write humor for him to take off to, uh, to conferences uh, and use. Much of that was middle school type humor. Tom got a great chuckle out of it, but uh, I'll save that from from not using that today. Um, Tom was also you know, good at kind of poking fun to kind of motivate you. And, and uh, in the early days of computers, we got new Macs in the departments in the 80s. We finally had things like Word and McPaint. And uh, I was kind of new at that. This is in the day where you know, these were very basic programs. And, and as an as a engineer, more technical guy, I wasn't very good at spelling. And so I had these slides up there with all kinds of spelling errors. And there's Tom. That's, that's that. It said, what, he said, what tool did you use? Dave's spell? Because <laughs> this is when you actually had to run a separate pr spelling program from your word processing program. It was so long ago. Um, so, uh, but, but that humor was, was good and well taken. Uh, I'm still a, a, a notorious speller today. Um, so uh, I think a lot of the other ones uh, were covered from others earlier today. Um, yeah, the spelling bee, uh, that great industrial experience, uh, how he stretched that six weeks into a year. But um, I just want to say, Tom, thank you for everything you've done for me. I, I wouldn't, as many have said here today, I wouldn't be here today teaching the chemical engineering senior design class and others uh, if it weren't for Tom. So, Tom, thank you for that. I appreciate it much. I'm glad we've been able to stay in touch over the last 35, 40 years as I've come back to town and visited with you and and met Jolene as well in some of my last visits. So thank you very much for everything you've done for all of us. The diversity hire. OK, hi, I'm George Georgiou. And I'm a professor here. I was hired by Tom, and let's cut the chase. This is not an idolization. This is a roast, so it's got to be a roast, right? So we have to say some things that are along those lines. First of all, back to what uh, Roger mentioned earlier, I played basketball with Tom once, and I realized that he never understood the difference between rugby and basketball, <laughs> and I never played again. Second, uh, everybody has been like extolling Tom's sense of humor. Tom is a very jovial guy, but if he has to say a joke, eh, I'm not sure. And I remember the days when we have the gag gifts in after the Christmas parties that were dreaded because Tom was trying his hardest to join everybody in congeniality, but it didn't always work out. I don't know if you, Roger, if you remember those days. Uh, so he's a very jovial person, but not necessarily the best person in terms of telling a joke. But still doesn't mean that he doesn't have a good sense of humor. More importantly, now from a personal standpoint, I really feel great gratitude for Tom. He hired me. Uh, I had no intent of going to Texas. Texas was a foreign land, literally. I mean, I was in upstate New York, and I thought the last place I'm going to go in te is Texas. So Tom invited me and my wife to come and visit here in February. Smart idea, upstate New York, <laughs> Texas. And he picked us up from the airport and he took us to the oasis. He said, oh, this is how people, what, how people party here. And then he took us to drive by Maqueda's house on the lake. And he said, this is where faculty live here. <laughs> and we thought, holy cow, this is a good gig. Okay, and I signed on the dotted line. <laughs> and then I came here, and I found an interesting place. On the one hand, there was the hippie Austin, which was half of the campus. And on the other hand, 
there was the other part of the campus that was not really exactly up to the times. <laughs> and at least that was my experience, and I, that's what I relate to you. The chemical engineering department had a lot of very kind men that grew up in a different century. <laughs> and they were actually not particularly interested in adapting to the times. At that time when I joined the chemical engineering department, it was about 15, ranked about 15th, and it was like self-evident to Jim Rawlings and myself and Jeff Hubble, the three amigos, we were named that way, not necessarily because it was a compliment, <laughs> okay, uh, that we thought we should make this place better, but not everybody agreed with that vision. And Tom had the vision that, no, we need to hire people that have different talents and different skill sets and can move us forward. And my God, I mean, his record, I don't know why he hired me, but somehow it worked out. I don't know why he hired any of us, but we all worked out, I think, very, very well. And in seven or eight years, the department moved in its rankings from being number 15 to number seven. I, I don't think that's ever happened in any other department that I know of to progress so quickly because of the influence of one person. And I've seen him in action when he was a chair, and he was masterful. He would go around to everybody's office and he would make them like come to his position. And then when we had the faculty meeting, it was kumbaya. Everybody <laughs> agreed because he had done all the work to convince everybody that this is the right way to proceed. And most of the time it worked. That coupled with a jovial personality and, a, and in, in my opinion, a boundless energy because the man was out there hitting the pavement every day at for different reasons and for different causes. I mean, look, I'm a bio person, you can tell. I don't have a PowerPoint slide that <laughs> all these other control dudes that were talking earlier, okay? So uh, to bring all these people together and build something, that requires a special talent and a special energy. And like everybody else, he wanted the credit that everybody deserves and needs for their work. But I think what motivated Tom, at least in my experience was just his desire to do things, to build things and do something better for everyone and something that's sensible. And that is a spirit I think that stayed in the department and had a lasting effect and it's still part of what is driving this place and it transformed this place. So he's the best chairman that I could possibly imagine. I'm not saying this because this is a celebration for Tom there, I'm on record, 20 years ago, I got a go an award from our professional society and I thanked three people, my advisor, Adam Heller, because he was inspirational in some ways, and Tom, because he was the best mentor a young faculty could possibly have. And by the way, I still remember, and Jeff Haber remembers all these days when we go to his office and I'll say, okay, how much is it gonna cost me this time? Because we're assistant professors who were always asking for money and who always come up with a way to come up with more resources to support people around him because he knew that by building, by helping people, he would basically, he was building something bigger than any of us. So thank you for everything. So my name is Scott Bushman. I was a grad student for Tom uh, in the 90s. And I want to certainly reflect the same sentiment that has been given previously about how his mentorship has affected me. Uh, the things I think about are the experience I had when I chose to be a member of Tom's group and I went to go have this, uh, as uh, Stephanie mentioned it, this sorority uh, picking contest, as it were, and Tom uh, afterward told me, I expect to see you twice a year. That's what I was told. You know, twice a year. That was what you would expect to see with Tom. And I could go spend the time with Ike, who was my co-advisor, for the other times, and I would get what I needed. And so that was a very uh, interesting reflection 
on how this worked out. But I would say the other thing that was transformative for my experience was how Tom's group was driven by an industrial mission. And I use that example by the people that are over at my table, which include Tom Badgewell and uh, Anthony Toprak, who both had come from industry and had come back to the university to be PhD students. I think about it from the standpoint that I went to work for Stephanie in order to do my first career at Texas Instruments, how I went from TI and I went to work for Anthony Toprak and I worked for him when I was at AMD. Currently, I am working for Amitabh Sabarwal, who is one of Tom's master students, also from the 90s. And I think about the impact of the network that I was able to be a participant in and be involved in this environment that was a result of Tom's mentorship and leadership and contribution to the community of process control, specifically around semiconductor manufacturing. When I talk to my colleagues about this, John Stuber over here also transformed in the same way and is able to go out into other industries and drive this experience out to others. And so I thank you very much. Uh, Paul Fisher, Chemical Engineering 74. Uh, I've got a couple of stories about Dr. Ecker. The first one was some of the pictures I've seen of him are not what I remember when he arrived on campus. I thought I remembered an afro with a beard. But anyway, most of you know Tom's athletic prowess. When he got to UT, he was very disappointed because he found out that the faculty did not have any organized athletics. He was very upset, we heard this. I was working with the ASCHE student chapter intramural group. We recruited Tom, but he's a professor. We can't have him on our list, but he looks like a grad student. We signed him up as a grad student. <laughs> the problem we had, we're in the huddle playing touch football. You can't say, Dr. Edgar, go long. So it was, Tom, go long. We had to bite our tongues to do that. <clears throat> Next story I've got about Dr. Edgar was my senior year, my last semester, I had Dr. Edgar for optimization. And I'd forgotten this story, and he reminded me at a dinner we had several years ago. <clears throat> I had three other courses I had A's in. He posted a B for me. I was a little upset. Went to his office. I remember the stacks. <laughs> we discussed. I pleaded my case. We discussed. I pleaded my case. And to my surprise, he said, I'll shoot you for it. Now, I don't know most of you know, he had a basketball hoop in his office <laughs> with a Nerf basketball. Yes, yes. So we shot for my grade. I got an A. <laughs> now, well, I was gonna, I was gonna ask this question because all the years I've been wondering about this, I don't think I was that good. And did you have enough pity on me? To <laughs> it was my home court too. Yes, it was. And I knew you were pretty good at it. So anyway, <clears throat> the, I need to check my notes. But the last question, oh, <clears throat> we know how trustworthy Dr. Edgar is. We know how impeccable he is with what he does. I have the distinct honor and privilege 
of having Dr. Edgar's signature on my first hole-in-one scorecard. But I will tell you this. I didn't watch him hit the ball while I was, while I was playing golf, because you've seen some of the slides of him <laughs> playing golf. But thank you. And I want to know, do you remember what you shot? I have the scorecard. <laughs> I have a picture of the scorecard. Yes, and your signature, so I'm not going to tell anybody. <laughs> the last thing is, uh, our senior year, Dr. Ed was the advisor for the AICG student chapter. And the AIC student chapter at UT, UT that year was awarded a National Outstanding Student Chapter Award. And thank you to you. And thank you for being my professor. Yes, but thank you. So my name is Sam Smollick. So Michael Pell and his great planning skills called Paul and me last night and said, you're going to fill in for me on the roast. <laughs> so I stayed up all night long trying to think of some things to say. And, and uh, today, and I wish everybody could have been at the symposium today. It was, it was awesome. And uh, we showed a, a um, well, there were a lot of highlights, and tonight you've heard a lot of things about it. Well, well uh, Michael sent me a, a CV, your CV, last night. And I've interviewed thousands of people in my career, but I've never seen a 54-page CV. <laughs> Literally 54 pages of highlights. It's incredible. And so we know he's famous. Um, one of the pictures that's been scrolling uh, on the board and we talked about this afternoon was a golf tournament when River, River Place opened up on 22-22. I had uh, a foursome invitation to go there and Tom Kite was going to be with us, so I invited Tom to go. We're driving up to the course and I said, Dr. Edgar, have you ever met Tom Kite? He said, no but he's never met me either. <laughs> <laughs> and so he knew he was going to be famous. So my engagement, my uh, friendship with him goes back to 1971. I entered the University of Texas in September of 71, and that was your first semester on campus. And so <clears throat> I knew real quickly he was a visionary. Because he told us, he said, buy a good $35 post slide rule because you'll use it the rest of your career. <laughs> and that, seriously, we all used slide rules at that time. And two years later, the hand calculators came out. So <laughs> I still have it. And then, you know, of course, to me, he's Dr. Edgar, right? There I was, 18 years old. I didn't know he was 26. You know, so he seemed old, but he was probably thinking, I've just, just been in your shoes. Well, he, um, he said, I like to give a lot of, you'll remember this story, I like to give a lot of little exams. And, um, and we had two girls in our class, one of the first classes, I think, to, to have girls. And he said, so I'm going to call these, these, these exams quizzes. He said, if it wasn't girls, I'd call them my testes. <laughs> so <you> remember that? <laughs> I figured everybody would understand that from you. <laughs> and, um, and then, uh, you know, now, I made a student loan in college, and I paid it off, okay? But I, bad. But I also had a... Uh, a part-time job in the stock room, chemical engineering stock room, and, the, and Paul Fisher was there. We worked together. It was the top floor of EP Shock. And so one of our most important assignments was to make coffee for the faculty. <laughs> They'd have a coffee break like at 9 and, or 9.30 and 2.30, right on the dot. And it was usually led by Maqueda. You know, but during that time, the old timers, I remember Dr. McKetta and Cunningham and Van Winkle, 
they'd come up there. And they made us sit at the table, too, and have coffee with them, which was a great experience for us. Well, Dr. Edgar would come in quite a bit, and he'd tell stories. And every once in a while, McKetta would go, I just don't know about this new generation. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that a lot. Anyway, I appreciate the long 50-year friendship and wish you and your family the very best. Thank you. Hi, Tom. Uh, I'm Anthony Toprak. Uh, I was uh, Tom's PhD student between uh, 1988 and 1992. And it's been a real pleasure seeing uh, my colleagues, uh, fellow students during, at this time. Um, you, you all look really great. Um, you looked a lot better 30 years ago. <laughs> and, and I'm feeling a lot better about my degree of hair loss right now. But, uh, but I first met Tom in 1979 when I was uh, entering the chemi department as a master's student. I was a factory retread because I was a physics major as an undergraduate. So I had to see the graduate advisor to invent my remedial curriculum. And uh, so I go to the door of the graduate advisor and knock on it, and I hear this sonorous you know, baritone voice come in. And I open the door, and I'm just immediately struck by the feeling that I've walked into a closet where a homeless man lives. <laughs> is sitting there is this guy, and he's, you could politely say, informally dressed with a beard that, you know, scraggly beard that you, some would, someone would say maybe moth-eaten. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> and, and there's these towers of papers. Everybody's talking about the same thing. But, it, I mean, I tell you, it was stunning. This like there's papers everywhere. It's, and there's a little narrow tunnel where you could get to his desk. <laughs> and so, so I, I entered the curriculum. I worked for Gary Rochelle uh, on the second floor of EP Shock. And across the way was, uh, were Tom students doing coal gasification. And uh, one of them was Xiaoping. He was a, a Taiwanese student. And he had a picture of Tom receiving an award at an AICHE meeting on his door. And underneath it was a, a Chinese saying, behind every great general lay a thousand skeletons. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, fast forward to 1988, uh, four years of, of general confusion about what I was doing, which I later learned Tom shared with me. Uh, and you know, at the end of this, at the end of your all this grind of trying to figure out what you're doing and putting out a dissertation, is your final defense, of course, and. You can't, you know, it's, it's hard to describe how nervous graduate students are about their final defense, because it's been years, and they have to stand in front of the faculty and talk about what they do and defend it, and all of, all of our fears about, you know, not being good enough or just, you know, raging through our minds. So we, of course, you know, students get together and we strategize, you know, and I, I, Tom Badgerill was my cohort then, and we used to talk about how we're going to handle this. You know, and people did things differently, like some people would show up and they would give coffee and donuts to the faculty. And these people were fools. Because why do you want them to be comfortable and sit there and enjoy themselves? You want to get out of there. And we decided we want to schedule at 11.30 because they're going to get hungry. <laughs> and it's going to end. So, so I'm going through my defense. And you know, very scarily, Tom raises his hand and he asks me a question. I don't remember what it was. But I start to answer it, and I remember, as I'm answering it, Tom falls asleep. <laughs> so I'm thinking, what's the protocol on this? Do I, do I, do I keep eye contact? His, his eyes are closed. But I answer the question, and right when I finish, he wakes up and nods his head. It's like, OK. <laughs> so I, I get out and uh, work at a job that pays money. And fast forward 20 years, and uh, I uh, get Tom to join our board on the Texas Early Music Project, which is a nonprofit that does performances in Austin that does uh, of uh, medieval, Baroque, and Renaissance music. And it's a great organization. Come to our concerts. Uh, and Tom joined the board because there's this kind of 
a strange connection between mathematical ability and music interest. It's been remarked on by many. As a matter of fact, uh, many of you don't know this, but Jim Rawlings is a fabulous tenor, and he is later today going to actually sing My Way for us. Uh, so, <laughs> so in, in conclusion, I'd just like to say that, that um, first I was a little bit surprised. I didn't, I don't, there, I you know, know Tom for many years, but I, I was very surprised to see that he was the spelling champ champion in Oklahoma because I didn't know they spoke English in Oklahoma. <laughs> But um, there, is, there is something that is very hard to describe about the whole experience of being in school and having a professor, uh, a teacher, uh, let's, let's just say a teacher, a teacher in your life. And I think we, all of us have, who have been to university, I think have this experience, well, I know I have this experience of, of dreaming that I've taken a full load of courses and forgotten to attend them all, and don't know where they are, and then I have a test coming up. But, but uh, the, the bottom line is, is, is that the experience of university and, and our teachers are etched into our memories. And Tom is certainly etched into mine. He comes to my mind at random times of the day over random things because he's an important person in my life. So thanks, Tom. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, hello, Tom. Uh, Venkat Venkata Subramanian. I'm a professor of chemical engineering at uh, Columbia University in New York. I met uh, Tom uh, some 35 years ago at Columbia when he came to deliver the AMIC lectures, uh, you may recall, it's fall of 1988. And um, I'm here to join in, in the celebration of many success of uh, Tom, but also I'm here to express my appreciation and gratitude for his support uh, throughout my academic uh, career. As uh, some of the uh, systems guys know, I'm an outsider to the systems area. My, I don't belong to one of these celebrated uh, lineages uh, that was mentioned this afternoon, the sergeant uh, academic tree or the lapidus tree to which uh, uh, Tom belongs. Uh, my training was in statistical uh, mechanics. So I was an outsider, and so that's strike one. And, uh, this, and then I was also doing one of the few guys doing AI in the 80s, which no one cared about, <laughs> and strike two. So, so it's a miracle that I got tenure promoted, and then I'm, I'm here as a professor talking to you because of the uh, advice and uh, help and support I've received in the last three decades uh, uh, from uh, Tom Edgar. Uh, I remember very well 30 years ago, uh, he kind of put his finger on the problem clearly by saying, uh, the problem with you, Venkat, is you are neither fish nor fowl. Uh, I said, of course not, I'm a vegetarian. So <laughs> But that, that got me thinking, and then I kind of positioned myself closer to the control guys. What he was saying was there were only two classes of people at the time, design and control. They didn't know where to put me. And so I kind of positioned myself closer to the control guys, and that seemed to have worked out all right. And uh, I'm happy to tell you, Tom, that uh, uh, now that AI is hot again, people are returning my calls. So. <laughs> And congratulations on a wonderful career, and I wish you all the best, and do stay in touch. Thank you. So, thank you to all who decided to share. Um, it is unfortunately, I, I, we have a few more speakers teed up, but unfortunately it's getting late. So. I want to do two things. One is to thank the sponsors of this wonderful event. They're listed up here, um, and they've made a, a, a great contribution. We are really grateful because they made this event possible. So let's give them a round of applause.
And of course, Tom owes us something. It's not as if he, he hasn't given enough. We'll, we'll extract our last pound of flesh for the evening in the form of a rebuttal. Um, up to you. If you want to walk around, you can take this mic or you can do the podium. Okay, well, I think, uh, in my opinion, I got a lot of softballs tonight. <laughs> it could have been a lot worse. You were preparing me for a lot worse, Michael, so. And, and really... Uh, you have a really thick skin. Yeah. I, I have to... Is it not on? No, it's on. It's, it's, it's on. Yeah. So I, I want to go back to Jim Rawlings, who refused to answer my questions today. Because actually, you know, it's interesting, uh, Shupad Warden is here today, and you pointed that out as one of the papers that uh, you and I co-authored. So now I'm going to tell the story of how that all started and why he was an angry young man, as pointed <laughs> out today. So Jim and I went to a conference in Maryland, University of Maryland, uh, for like DICOPS or something like that, and he was like maybe two years, assistant professor, maybe three years. And uh, so he was there, and he gave a paper some session, and I gave a paper in another session. And, uh, and then apparently, as he reported to me after the conference, when he got back to Austin, he said, you know, after I gave my talk, you know, someone came to talk to me, asked me questions, and, and said, so you're one of Tom Edgar's graduate students. <laughs> and that really pissed Jim off. He said, and immediately, he had already concluded, he says, we're not ever going to author another paper together again. <laughs> and we'd only done like one at that point. And so that was it. So that's why we have this big drought between Jim and me. And whereas Michael Baldea is a much more reasonable person, not nearly as angry, <laughs> angry as Jim, he and I published a lot of papers together. So, you know, there's different ways to do it. But uh, that's why Jim said he did it my way. But actually, he did it. In a, in a very interesting way in that uh, he went up against some of the biggest uh, names in control, presenting ideas that, <coughs> that <coughs> probably when he got reviews, he got really nasty reviews back because the establishment, you know, wanted to fight back, said, okay, this guy from Texas, we can't let him, you know, become famous. So. <coughs> And that's part of uh, the, uh, I think, the struggle that, uh, you know, we had at Texas. <clears throat> There's a lot of stuff, and I don't, you know, we don't have time to go into this, but, you know, when I came here in 1971, uh, like George Georgie was saying, it was a really conservative faculty, okay? Uh, I came there with flowered shirts, okay, <laughs> bell-bottom pants. But I wore a tie, pur a purple tie. <laughs> so, you know, I was trying to, you know, at least make my statement, I guess, of, that I was coming from a different part of the country, although, as was pointed out, I was born in Oklahoma. <laughs> but, but as, as <laughs> keep laughing my jokes, Taylor. <laughs> uh, that, that, Darrell Royal said famously, he says, Oklahoma is a nice place to be from. <laughs> and I sort of stuck with that one. The, although, going growing up in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, it's, you know, uh, oil town, Phillips Petroleum was there, city service was there for a number of years. And uh, so I was a poor guy who had <coughs> a father, and of course then you didn't talk about your mother working for Phillips, okay, they were all men, uh, who did not work for <coughs> either company. <clears throat> but he was a metallurgical engineer and worked for the National Zinc Company. So, so I basically got uh, 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 lo a lot of uh, uh, experience, you know, just seeing what my father did. And when it came time for, you know, summer jobs, I could <clears throat> actually go out there and work in the, the lab and analyze stuff and you know, titrate things, although I sometimes maybe try to speed things up by instead of using the, the 
the bulb to do pipetting, I went like that. <laughs> <laughs> Had to go see the dentist one time as a result of that, but uh, uh, <laughs> oh well. Anyway, but the point is I learned a lot, you know, sulfuric acid, okay, that's a big part of what they made. They made, you know, smelted zinc and made sulfuric acid. So I really got, you know, a good flavor of, of you know, what chemical engineering or engineering and, and manufacturing is all about. So that maybe helped my six weeks of... of <laughs>
the faculty there is a smaller group than say what we have at UT, but you know they really paid attention to the, the, the kids who were in the freshman year and and they knew I was taking a bunch of honors courses, so they said, you know, maybe you don't need to sit through some of the remedial stuff we're trying to keep people, you know, retain people in chemical engineering because they were taking calculus and chemistry and physics, but they were taking not the honors course. And so they said, why don't you, and I, I had actually said, well, I love music even at that point. Did a lot of music growing up you know, in high school. And in fact, I still remember when I was four years old <coughs> at a small church in Arkansas we were singing Bringing in the Sheaves, and I was four, and I still was singing Bringing in the Sheaves, and everyone stops. <laughs> so <laughs> that's my first solo. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry I'm rambling a lot, but I'll try to you know, get, get to the point here. So when I was, and I got to do actually research as a freshman uh, on nucleate boiling, they just said, okay, you come in here and you start trying to build some things and run some experiments, see if you can get bubbles for the to form where you think they are, and then we'll take a high-speed movie of it, and so on. So I got exposed to doing <coughs> independent research then. So that was great. And then I got to uh, my sophomore year, and this was really, you know, we can now talk about the, you know, computing, because that's certainly one of the themes of the, of the event today. I uh, uh, had a, a professor, a Professor Wynog, in, in material and energy balances, <clears throat> and we were actually using David Himmelblau's book. Um, and he said, uh, and we, we, none of us knew anything about computer programming at that point. So he said, okay, we have this flash vaporization problem. Many of you remember that from, it's an iterative calculation you have to do. And you know, these days, of course, you do it with a computer. Well, uh, none of us knew how to program. But the professor said, okay, I'm going to give you this problem in two weeks. You need to go out and learn computer programming, write a program, submit it. And then, you know, that's your homework assignment. Well, <coughs> you talk about learning how to do something on your own. And of course, a lot of us buddied up with people to try to say, well, do you know anything about this? Have you ever been to the computer center? We, we had no clue. And so you learned it, OK? You had to. And then my junior year, uh, I got to do a special, you know, took a special course on computing. So that improved my computing background. So the computing thing kept building up. Uh, my PhD work, as mentioned, I went to the Princeton because uh, the uh, professor there, Leon Lapidus, uh, was uh, uh, the author of a famous book at that time, Digital Computation for Chemical Engineers, McGraw-Hill book. So I really felt like that was the right place to go. Now, uh, it, it was. I had an NSF fellowship. That was great. So, so Leon Lapidus didn't have to worry about raising money for me or anything like that. Well, Leon, you, you saw the comments today about playing tennis, and he was you know, involved with that business. Uh, uh, he basically would come in at 7.45 in the morning and be gone by 8.30, okay? That was his time at the office. He was in department chair part of that time. So <laughs> he worked from home a lot. He worked, he consulted for IBM once a week up in New York City and, and uh, uh, had a pretty good gig going, I thought. But uh, uh, he really felt like, and someone made a comment about how much time, or I guess Scott Bushman said how much time he could expect to talk to me. Well. So I spent, I, I added it up, basically, I spent three hours and three years working on my PhD with my advisor. So <coughs> you become very self-sufficient and learn, <coughs> learn how to work independently is what it is. And so <coughs> I always try to convey that lesson to my students. You know, you've got to, you know, when you graduate with a PhD, people expect you to be able to work independently. So we uh, basically, you know, I try to, to instill that idea and, you know, maybe I, you know, because we had so many people in the group and I was doing all this other stuff that you heard about today. You know, I wasn't always around as much, but I did think that I was really interested in making sure my students had a better experience than I did as a grad student. And then uh, later, interestingly enough, as a, when I was a faculty member, I, I was asked by the dean of the graduate school there to comment on my, my graduate experience. And so I wrote a blistering letter, <laughs> spelling out all this stuff, and said, yeah, we have seminars, the faculty never come, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I guess that still happens here too to some extent, but <laughs> oh well. But you know, the point is that I you know, sort of went out there and I got burned as a result because that letter got passed around. They knew who exactly wrote it, et cetera. So <clears throat> I probably paid a little bit of a price for that, but that's okay. But I think that's better. So I get, uh, you know, I, I go, uh, I'm basically like writing my dissertation on a computer. So word processing, we were already doing it then uh, in 1970. 
on a mainframe computer, basically writing, basically you could do uh, essentially two minutes of runtime. You basically could, could process a certain number of cards at a time using something called WAP4. And so you basically put, you put together your thesis on computer cards. And made, you know, and you had big, two big decks of cards. Then you feed them through the mainframe and you produce a dissertation. So that was my first experience with word processing. So, uh, you know, things were, things were doing. So I was, you know, again, deeply embedded in computing. Uh, my, uh, when I came to UT, uh, uh, they, you know, my startup package, I think, was maybe $10,000, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it was pretty paltry, but they did say they gave me enough money so I could buy a data general mini computer, and then my whole goal, uh, you know, I hired a, a tech guy to help me do, to essentially hook this thing up to a distillation column. In fact, it's the same distillation column if you go to the unit operations lab and CPE today, it's the same one. Uh, so that was there in 1971, and I had a student I shared with Joel Haugen uh, that uh, essentially uh, you know, spent two years just trying to model the system and instrument it and do all kinds of things. It was a very painstaking thing, but it was a really good learning experience and not something that you could really expect industry to, to implement. So, so it took a while for industry to really start picking up on this, and you heard a lot about the consortium. It took, you know, easily, you know, 10, 15 years before industry really started buying into computer control and using more advanced techniques. <coughs> so, uh, you know, the theme uh, that you heard a lot today was, was I, would, I would capture it as uh, build it and they will come. Now, how many people know what movie that came from? <coughs> One of my favorite movies. And one of the reasons is that you know, baseball was a sport when I was growing up. And, uh, you know, my father used to hit. <laughs> he hit fly balls to me almost every night. And so, uh, as you can see right now, that movie really, you know, it's, a, it's a, a growing up kind of story, I would think. Now, one of the things you didn't hear about today, um, when I was an assistant professor, uh, you know, I came here with a lot of these liberal ideas. Uh, my brother Bob, who's here tonight, was. Uh, <coughs> already on the, what I call the justice train, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, civil rights. <coughs> and so I come to, come to UT and come to engineering, and I look around, and I say, well, you know, all the faculty, with the exception of a few people, are white males. All the students are white. And so, uh, uh, one of the professors in mechanical engineering, Phil Schmidt, uh, and I got to know each other. He had come from Prairie View. He taught at Prairie View for a couple of years. And he and I and three or four other people, young, all young faculty, got together and said, you know, <coughs> we ought to start trying this place, trying to make this place more diverse. And And so after, and, and you know, we kind of took turns, several of us, I was the director of, that, of the Equal Opportunity Engineering Program for a couple of years. You know, we ran summer programs, we did raise money, we, you know, tried to figure out how to recruit people, et cetera. Um, <coughs> and again, it was all led by a bunch of, you know, rogue assistant professors. Uh, you know, I remember the department chair at that time, Bob Schechter, says, you know, I don't know why you spend your time on that. Uh, uh, you know, I would have hired a secretary to go do that or something. And I said, no, that's, that's not going to do it. And so <coughs> I was actually looking at the, uh, there's actually a published timeline for the School of Engineering. And that's one of the things. 
So that was, you know, <coughs> a contribution I'm still, you know, very proud of. And it's again, one of those things you said, well, <coughs> this is worth doing, so let's go with it. Let's, get, let's start doing something. Now, George, uh, we'll go ahead and fast forward. You know, I, I was graduate advisor for a while when we started thinking about, uh, you know, how do we make the, the graduate program stronger? At that time, it was mostly master's students, almost all, and, and a number of uh, PhD students, most of whom were international students. Uh, our, our model was basically, well, we, we try to find the best 10 graduates, bachelor's graduates, okay, uh, from chemical engineering at UT and convince them to stay on for a master's degree. And Brian Dinsmore was one of those, for example, I remember that. Uh, and uh, so we uh, uh, were, were sort of saying, and I remember Don Paul was chair then, he said, let's try to have the best master's program in the country. And I think we started down that road, but I'm not sure it was really taking off, and I'm not sure it was really going to succeed anyway. And so, uh, and I'd had actually a lot of uh, recruiting experience, uh, of all things, by being a rush chairman of a fraternity. Uh, you learn to make cold calls, you know, try to find talented people, convince them they should join. <coughs> and so, uh, uh, and I ended up in a group of fraternity that had, you know, like half of them were MDs, lawyers, you know, really smart people, but also a lot of good athletes, too. So, Bobby Douglas of the Chicago Bears was my roommate <laughs> for a year. So, uh, so we had a really interesting mix of people. But I, you know, kind of got used to this idea that, yeah, you should go out and try to, again, build something. So... Uh, I started thinking about the fact that, you know, we really need to, you know, up our recruiting effort. And that means maybe we should be raising money to bring people in. That was a totally, totally radical idea. Uh, and I was also, by the way, the first person in the department to hire his own secretary. Uh, uh, that was unheard of then. And people say, oh, that, you know, you should spend your money on grad students. You shouldn't be spending money on someone to help you do your work. Uh, and that's why we had all these piles of paper, because everything was going on paper then, right? Uh, that, <laughs> And so I needed someone to file stuff, to put things, you know, at least to organize the stuff so you could at least find it. And, you know, there was no electronic saving of anything back then. I, that's why I had to get a bigger office and, you know, <laughs> basically <laughs> fill it up with banker boxes full of papers. And so that's, you know, that's what you did back then. So. And, and by the way, I was super lucky uh, when I came to UT because they put me in an office suite with John McKetta. Bill Cunningham, and Ruth Crawford. <clears throat> and so I learned a lot by watching. Uh, in fact, you know, little known fact, you know, John McKetta actually had been vice chancellor of the UT system uh, in the late, late 60s. And that was a big, pro you know, big area that were the, the Board of Regents were a big problem then. The chair of the Board of Regents, Frank Irwin, was a big problem. Uh, firing presidents, threatening to fire presidents. Norman Hackerman was president. He left before he got fired, went to Rice. Uh, it was a mess. I mean, so there was a lot of turmoil at the university. They had a, the president that came in when I first came in, Stephen Spur, uh, was good for maybe a year and a half before Irwin started saying, no, we, we don't want this guy to be president anymore. So it was really a lot of turmoil, uh, you know, at the, the you know, high levels of the university administration. And, and I won't get into a lot of the stories there. You can read about it on the web. But uh, I, I still remember, I was reminding Roger of this, that I remember getting a book that was written by a guy named Ronnie Duggar called Our Invaded University. I don't know if you've seen that one at all. No. You should read it. So uh, <laughs> it talks about you know, all the stuff going on in the 70s because, you know, as I'm sitting from afar and hearing some of the stuff going on, the lieutenant governor and the governor and other stuff, and let's get rid of tenure and so on. So <laughs> I said, well, that sounds like what was going on in the 70s, you know, when I was here. But so in any event, we, we uh, uh, getting back to, the, you know, like 1980 or so, you started thinking about, okay, how can we recruit better students? And uh, I was telling Wayne that I think that he was kind of at an inflection point for the department in terms of graduate students. And it actually started 
Uh, so I became chair in 1985, um, and that was uh, uh, a time where we said, okay, we need to really go big on recruiting graduate students and recruiting PhD students. And so if I look back, uh, and, and George was talking about some of the things that, that happened while he was an assistant professor. So George, you came in 1986, Six. yeah. So. We started realizing, and I realized, now, okay, so you mentioned my, you know, it was mentioned that, you know, I'm a great believer in mathematical models. Well, that, that's a little bit like understanding cause and effect. So you figure out, okay, if we do this, maybe something will, good will happen. Do we know what's going to happen? Well, not, not exactly, but we can try some things. So I, you know, uh, since I've been a graduate advisor and I became aware of, of things that uh, the department needed to do, in order to become a first-rate faculty. And for example, when I came here to UT, every faculty member was teaching four courses a year, two a semester. Uh, I realized that all of our competition in the top 10 was not doing that, and most of them were teaching one course a semester or two a year. Uh, and so I, I kind of made it the first goal of, okay, if we're at four courses a year, and that's what it was when Don Paul stepped down as chair, then let's move that down to three and figure out a way to do that. Now, some of that's subject to, okay, how big are the classes and, you know, what's your enrollment? Is enrollment going up? Is it going down over the years? You know, that, that was always happening in, in engineering and chemical engineering. So uh, we uh, started actually making a plan and, and, you know, I think that, you know, when, when George and Jim uh, and Jeff Hubble came into the department, we recruited them, then uh, we started, I started getting a few people that I thought were going to buy into this idea, because they wanted to build programs, they wanted to get PhD students and so on. And so it's just a matter of, you know, getting people to, to line up and to understand that that's, that's a goal. And it also means raising money uh, so that you can, you know, bring people in, you can provide, you know, research assistantships and things like that. So all this stuff had to start happening. Uh, but the faculty was still basically pretty conservative back then, and uh, they didn't necessarily see it that way. And, and the other thing that I encountered in the 70s was that, that the faculty was kind of split between there was a group of people that think, thought of themselves as theoreticians and another group that thought of themselves as practitioners. And they didn't really like each other. And so that was a big problem. And you know, I kind of looked at that and said, OK, I'm not going to take so I was really more of a theoretician. But I said, as a cis professor, I'm not going to take sides. I need to, you know, not get, get involved in that game. But I knew that, you know, we needed to move, you know, away from a more conservative view of all of this. And so that's kind of how we started nudging people along. I still remember one of my colleagues in the electrical engineering department, who's department chair, Ed Powers, uh, said, you know, you operate as a department chair by the power of persuasion. So <coughs> you can't give orders. You've got to persuade people to come to your side. And so that's really, I saw that as, you know, being one of my missions that, that I had to do that as a department chair. Uh, how we got George and Jim and Jeff hired, all hired the same year, uh, same time, it was actually one of these almost a, almost a political negotiating thing. It's like, well, if you vote for this guy, then okay. If you, if you guys vote for this guy, then the rest of us will vote for this other guy. And so. Uh, and we did want to move strongly into the bio area, and so George was one of the people that we thought would really help us do that, and Jeff Hubble was another one. And of course, Jim was more in the my area of process systems, and so uh, I thought he would be a good choice, and I knew him quite well at that point. Uh, so we did manage to get all three of them at once, but it was, uh, I still remember, George, that, uh, I won't say who said this, but one of the faculty members uh, said, yeah, people from the Medi Mediterranean they're just a little bit more hot-headed, aren't they? So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, so there's a lot of ideas that, that came up. That, that, but we, we, we started, you know, sort of everyone started understood the need to move to the PhD program. And I also understood that, you know, if someone comes to visit and they visit, the, you know, various graduate students and all they meet are master's students, they think, well, okay, I guess that's what I'm supposed to be if I come here. But if they get to meet mostly PhD students, then they start thinking, well, maybe I should be a PhD student. And so we had this gradual change then in the 80s of people deciding that, uh, you know, 
they wanted to come here and do a PhD, and they saw other people who were PhD students, and that's probably what Wayne and Stephanie and other people have talked about today. The model was then a PhD student, and a PhD who is from the U.S. as well. So we, we went really hard towards recruiting a lot of people from the Midwest and Southeast and other places from U.S. You know, uh, universities and departments of chemical engineering. And so it somehow it did happen. Uh, you know, over you know a seven or eight year period, we went. You know, we moved into the new building in in, in 1984, uh, and by and that was actually sized to to house uh, 120 graduates and so uh, graduate students. So we went basically from mostly 60 60 grad students who were mostly master students, almost all master students, to maybe 20 master students and 100 PhD students, and that was again a collective effort by the faculty. And I think that. <coughs> the sort of comments made by Nicholas and, and by George about the collegiality factor. You know, everyone said, yeah, let's go do this, okay? Shortly thereafter, we were, I was able to get the teaching load down to one, sem one course per semester. And so the faculty were starting to kind of see, well, yeah, we can compete with the big boys. Another area was in awards. Uh, uh, the only person who won a national award from AICHE when I came here was John McKetta. And I was lucky in that I got into, I, some people talk about my coal gasification work in the 1970s. You know, we had the Arab our oil embargo, and a lot of us started looking around. I saw John McKetta going around giving energy talks everywhere, and I said, you yeah, know, maybe this would be a good area that I'll look at, too. And the funny thing is, is that uh, I was reading about this technology called underground coal gasification, and the one thing they said in there is that they don't know how to control it. And I said, oh. I'm the control guy. <laughs> now, it turns out it's really a modeling problem, okay? But, you know, just being able to, to manage the whole thing. And that was really one of the first interdisciplinary projects the department ever undertook. It had, you know, chemical engineering, petroleum engineering, uh, geology, environmental engineering. And so we built up some big programs that way. And so that was an example of, you know, a lot of the projects we got started in the, in the, in the late 70s and in the early 80s and started you know, getting bigger programs, more student supported, more money for the student support, and that was, you know, what it took. But also as a result of a lot of that work and, and you know, some, I guess, some helpful p uh, reference letters that uh, I was uh, uh, <coughs> selected to, uh, in, in 1981, to receive the Colburn Award. And that's a, an award <coughs> for uh, uh, someone who uh, is under the age of 35, so I, you know, starting when I was 26, maybe maybe you think 10, but no, 26, uh, and so you know I had you know a lot of things going on at that point. You know I had a lot of benefits working with Lawrence Livermore Labs and other things, and so I had been able to really develop a really decent program. Uh, and and but it's funny because a lot of the establishment uh, academics looked around and said, well, you know. We know who should be getting the Colburn Award. Should someone from one of our schools and not Texas, and <coughs> so they were totally surprised when someone from Texas won the award. And uh, <laughs> and I thought it was funny because uh, when I got the award, I said it's the first time the Colburn Award was ever given for coal burning. <laughs> <laughs> and since then, we've had a lot, of, a number of faculty in chemical engineering win that same award. And so it became now, okay, what's going to set us apart is our faculty receiving the top research awards. And so I said, okay, we need to dedicate a staff person, it turned out to be Ruth Crawford, uh, who really knew how to do this kind of thing, put together award packages, and we'd have awards committee made up of some of the senior faculty and figure out who should be nominated. And so that got that business started. And I think you can now see, you know, since the mid 80s until currently today, Texas is one of the top winners of AICHE awards and ACS awards among chemical engineering departments. So I think we've managed to do that. We've got the, the visibility now. And students who are looking to come and do graduate study, they look at that. And they say, well, you know, who, who in your, your faculty have won awards? And so it's, you know, really, uh, I think, turned out to be a big and So we still have an awards committee. Uh, maybe we don't have quite as many you know, staff help on that, but it's, you know, it's still something that's important. And, and so I think that also helped launch the department, as George was saying, you know, from maybe number 15 to number seven or eight in a 
in a very short period of time. And so again, I can look back on that saying, well, that was a build and they will come kind of moment. Uh, it also wasn't mentioned very much uh, uh, about the fact that, that uh, you know, I had a lot of involvement with computing at the university level uh, after I got here, and uh, got on something called the Faculty Computer Committee. Uh, I started getting interested in computer-based education, uh, doing some work around that area. Uh, the Faculty Computer Committee was basically the interface, the faculty interface with the, the computing center on how they should be spending discretionary funds. And so I got to you know, be aware of what was going on there. Well, what, was, what happened over time, uh, uh, after I was associate dean uh, in, uh, in the engineering school, and that was, uh, ironically, that was one of the jobs that uh, Herb Woodson asked me to become associate dean when he was dean uh, for academic affairs. And I kind of looked at what the associate dean was doing. I said, you know, I don't think that job's worth doing. I want more valuable to you as chairman of the Department of Chemical Engineering. So I did another four years, and then Herb came back to me again and said, uh, well, I'd like uh, you, know, you to consider being associate dean again. And I said, well, Herb, I told you. I said, I don't think that job is worth doing. He said, well, I'm going to make it worth your while. So I'm going to give you half of my <laughs> responsibilities and we're going to give you the, you know, you're going to be in charge of, you know, promotion and tenure and all the stuff that's really important uh, academically. And so I did that. But then, uh, you know, one of my disappointments is that I got uh, dumped in the, uh, the, the next dean search because I was too close to the previous dean. Okay, well, <laughs> I knew too much about what the dean needed to do, I guess. But, you know, these things happen. But the consolation prize was that... Uh, 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 the provost, Mark Udoff, had just fired uh, the, the director of the computation center uh, after 25 years <laughs> in that job uh, because he didn't think that they were providing customer service. Now, Mark had been dean of the law school. He actually had, you know, it's service agreements with the computation center to do some of the work there. Uh, uh, and he was not getting, you know, a feeling that it was going to happen. So he just summarily fired the, <laughs> the computation director <laughs> after you know, gave him several chances to do it. Well, so now he's stuck without a, without a director of the computation center. And so the provost office is looking around, well, who could we get to come in and actually take this thing over? Uh, so, uh, and I was not, you know, <laughs> trying to get involved with this, although I'd been involved with lots of computing on campus. Uh, uh, they somehow you know, came to me and said, okay, we need you to come in and take it. And they knew, I, they, they knew that I knew a lot of the people who worked there 300 people worked there, so it was a big operation. And they needed someone who could come in and actually change what they were doing, so change the culture. And, and so that was really, you know, a big challenge. And this was about the time uh, that, you know, we started seeing websites occurring. We were starting to worry about remote access to computing. All kinds of stuff was going on. It was a really exciting time. And, and after, you know, I said, well, I'm, not, I'm just going back to be a faculty member now after being associate dean, then, uh, yeah, maybe this will be an interesting challenge. So I actually decided to go do that. And so I did that for five years. Uh, and, you know, Michael didn't mention this, but he was one of my management consultants and, and said, okay, I've got, you know, seven layers of, of you know, authority in there. And, you know, it, it was a, a classical example of, you know, too many layers. People weren't really close enough to the workers, et cetera. And, and they also didn't understand the idea of customer service. I think that's still a problem for a lot of IT people, although not Randy Rice, by the way. He's, he's, he's great, and, and I hired Randy, so <laughs> I'll take credit for that. But in any event, uh, that was a really great ride because lots of exciting things were happening. I learned a lot about you know, computing. I was actually in charge of supercomputing at that time, so I got exposed to that, and that's where Jim Davis and I you know, started interacting because he was C C CIO at that time at Ohio State. Uh, so, so I really like that. Uh, it, it, I remember it still, though, that, that they weren't sure I was going to take the job, and so I was at a retreat for a number of people from the, you know, uh, from the campus, and Mark Udoff actually cornered me in the restroom and said, okay, I need an Edgar, are you going to take this job or not? And so he wasn't going to let me leave the restroom until I told him <laughs> about that. I'm not that. going to take that approach. <laughs> 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 <Good idea. laughs> well, <laughs> not the men's restroom, yeah, anyway. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, that was really a great experience. But then at, at that point, I said, okay, I'm ready to come back and be a, you know, a regular faculty member after five years. Uh, although I, I, that really convinced me that you know, this convergence of IT and 
process control and chemical engineering was a thing that's going to happen, and we all, you know, we ought to be dealing with it in the future. Uh, and so, and, and I should also mention, by the way, that uh, I left there. Uh, you know, I guess I, th I thought I might have a chance of becoming vice president of IT, uh, but they picked someone from Yale, so they wanted to go outside again. Uh, I said, okay, fine. But then after that point, every person they hired as the IT vice president got fired <laughs> to the present day. Okay, so I probably got out at a good time. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, so I went back starting doing normal faculty stuff in the in two thousands and and uh, uh, got you know sort of we had the second coming of the energy crisis in the early two thousands as well, and so I started getting interested in that. But I was at that point a rehabilitated coal researcher, uh, <laughs> so I started thinking more about well we need to think more about renewables and get more in that direction and. And you know, Michael Weber did a great job of talking about the things he and I were doing together with Pecan Street and, and Iger and other big projects that involve renewables and, and lots of good interdisciplinary research. Uh, but then uh, the, the other thing that happened that, that Michael talked about, which is that uh, we had this big flap about uh, uh, conflicts of interest on certain reports that the Energy Institute was providing. And uh, uh, we had another situation where the director of the Energy Institute basically was told, you know, you're out of here. Uh, but then they didn't know who they were going to get. Greg Fimbus was dean of engineering then. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the provost at that time was Steve Leslie, and he gave Greg the, the essentially the re responsibility of figuring out what we ought to do with the Energy Institute. And so I made the mistake of actually sending an email to Greg kind of explaining, well, here's you get some of the thought leaders together, and we should sort of figure these things out. And and Greg took that as a message that maybe he should talk to me about you know, taking over the Energy Institute. Uh, and, uh, and I remember, you know, once he, he floated the idea to me uh, in like a November, early December time frame, I said, I said, Greg, no, I don't want to go there. I don't, I don't think the people are any good. And we got to really make a big change there. I, I don't think I want to do that. Uh, he said, well, why don't you think about it over Christmas and then we'll talk about it again in January. So again, I keep having the situation where someone, I say no first, and then finally I say, okay, yeah, I'll do it. So, uh, so that was the next big, you know, administrative thing that I did was directing the Inter Energy Institute, and you heard a lot about that today from, from Michael. So, uh, so I've had some really interesting uh, you know, experiences, you know, doing administration, but my home was always chemical engineering. <coughs> and my colleagues were always always chemical engineering. And so uh, that was, you know, to me, you know, and I also had the philosophy that, okay, if I do take on an administrative job, then I'm not going to quit doing research. I'm not going to quit working with graduate students. Uh, I'm going to keep things going. And it means, yeah, you're working a lot of extra time, but, you know, it's still worth it to do it that way. And then you have something to go back to because you don't have to be an administrator forever. You know, that's, some people do Manage going to administration, they speak, you know, keep moving up to higher and higher levels, and they stick with it. But I didn't feel like I wanted to burn that bridge. So, uh, so anyway, that's kind of in a nutshell, you know, what uh, you know drove me, uh, you know, in the past and the current day. And and you know, I I really uh, appreciate uh, very much the uh, the comments that everyone made today because uh, uh, you know I. Like I said, I, I don't think anyone said anything too terrible about me. I, I felt like it was mostly really nice things, and, and so I have to feel pretty good about you know the, the you know what's happened here at UT, and you know we have 24 of my PhD students who came tonight. Uh, 24 others said they would have come except for schedule conflicts, and so you know I felt like there was you know really uh, a groundswell of support and the idea that they really did have a good experience, and so I'm 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 really pleased about that. Uh, so, uh, so I think I want to uh, uh, also close by uh, you know, talking about uh, uh, something that, that I learned from John McKetta. So, uh, in 1966, he uh, gave a gave a talk at, at, the, uh, 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 at a teaching effectiveness luncheon, and, and some of you remember Jim Sice, who unfortunately passed away recently. Uh, and Jim was organizing these kinds of luncheons, so John went and gave a speech, and then it was recorded, or he recorded, you know, what he said, 
And if you go over to the Kimmy department today, uh, and you look kind of above the mailboxes outside the office, then you'll see exactly what he said. But I want to read to you. <coughs> because, you know, I saw this back probably, you know, when the, in the 70s or 80s, and I said, you know, this is really does a good job of summarizing what, what it means to be a faculty member. Put it on my on my wall right next to where I sat, and didn't put any sacks in front of it, so I could see it. <laughs> uh, but I think I think that uh, uh, it really sums up, you know, what, what it's like uh, <coughs> to be a faculty member, certainly in chemical engineering, because uh, when one accepts a position as a family uh, university faculty member, he should expect to write proposals for research, equipment, and special projects to publish articles, reports, papers, and books, to keep up to date in this professional field, to serve on councils, boards, and commi committees, to maintain the best possible relation with alumni, legislators, and the business and industry of the region. In short, to be a responsible member of the community and to participate in many of its activities. But we all know that these many activities must never overshadow our greatest concern, the student. If our responsibilities to and concern for the student ever become secondary, we will be violating the trust we accepted when we joined the faculty. So those are powerful words, but I think it, you know, all the faculty here can certainly you know, hear those and say, yeah, that's, that's what I should be. So <coughs> I've been, it, Extremely blessed by, you know, so many great colleagues, by so many outstanding students, uh, by having, uh, you know, a loving, supporting family, a blended family now, uh, and um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, God has blessed me. I've been really lucky. I mean, some, some people say uh, luck is where preparation meets opportunity. You know, I, I had a slide that I like to use from time to time because we face insurmountable opportunities. And I think that's the, the, the direction in, fr in front of the faculty today because you guys can still make it happen. So, thank you. This is the University of Texas at Austin, after all. Well, I brought along my choir director. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Are you going to do the introduction? Yes, I was going to do that. That's it. Okay, well, anyway. So, okay. so this is the University of Texas. This is, this is our event. It's our home. We'll be closing with a duet of the Eyes of Texas. But everyone's supposed to join. Of course. Stand up and join. Somebody will we'll lead us. But, so, so I told you, Jolene, my choir director, she's also ordained minister, so uh, she is uh, uh, a reverend, but as you learned today, I'm Mr. Irreverent. <laughs> so that's a good she completes you. Yeah, and she also is teaching at UT Arlington. So, in any event, uh, we thought we would leave you all seeing the eyes of Texas, okay? You ready? The eyes of Texas are upon you. All the live long day, the eyes of Texas are upon you, you cannot get away, do not think you can escape them, so rise up early in the morn, the eyes of Texas are upon you, till Gabriel Bravo. 
Thank you very much. This concludes our program for the evening. Thank you for being here. A safe journey to those who join us from out of town.